Divinity Original Sin 2 from 2017 gets almost every single thing right, and the game itself is very aware of that. The introduction, which will take you anywhere from 5 to 20 hours by the way, takes the player from imprisonment to freedom and concludes with the claim, in no uncertain terms, that they are in for something very special. The game, like its introduction has, will just keep getting better. The game uses metalepsis, a rhetorical device, in order to take hold of telling by changing the level of what's being talked about from the level of fiction to that of the real world. It speaks to both in-game character and player at the same time. It's a bold move, boastful even, if it wasn't well earned after the introduction, which works as a microcosm. There are many ways, both good and bad, of breaking the fourth wall, of drawing attention to the artificiality of the fictional world. And this is a good one, because it has purpose. Divinity Original Sin 2 wants to capitalize on the work put into its introduction by displaying confidence in a bet on the player sharing it. And most players likely will. Welcome to Ludocriticism. This is Mini Read, a series where we step back from the big picture and look at a single element from a game. Original Sin 2 uses a certain type of rhetorical technique, metalepsis, to temper the impression the player gets from its introduction. The introduction in question is huge. You will escape prison, befriend up to six fully fleshed out companion characters, and confront an archbishop. It will take you many hours to complete, and there are around 40 quests in its area alone. When you finally step onto the deck of the Lady Vengeance at the end of it all, both impressed and worried it's already jumped the shark, your new guide, Malady, boldly states you're in for a journey which will be long, but exceedingly interesting. In Malady's line, the game's fiction is about reassuring the player character about the rest of their journey being worthwhile, but it simultaneously speaks to the rest of the player's journey being worthwhile. Malady is winking, but she's winking through the screen at you. This is a form of lepsis, which is a Greek word meaning seizure, in the sense of taking hold. Rhetorically, it's one meaning seizing hold of another. Here's a famous example. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow creeps in this petty pace from day to day to the last syllable of recorded time and all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player. That's Shakespeare, yo. It's also a form of metalepsis, where the meaning is transferred between levels of existence. In Macbeth, the levels are that of the play and that of the real world. Macbeth is speaking about the ultimate meaninglessness of his wife's suicide, but in the context of the play he's also speaking to us. The way the same technique is used in Divinity is certainly a good way of reassuring a player who is already on board, so to speak, but has an additional function. In order to have broad appeal in the market, the game needs a way to introduce itself to somebody who's never played anything like it. And since the genre the game exists within, Western computer RPGs, is marginal in today's climate, a new player is well served by knowing it is supposed to be long. With this metaleptic wink, this single line, Original Sin 2 not only hypes up the player searching for exactly this, but also lets anybody who stumbles into it know that everything is exactly the way it's supposed to be. I think the fourth wall is inherently easier to toy around with in games, since in a way, the player is always an agent within the walls of the fiction. In other words, the integrity of the fourth wall is compromised from the get-go. Playing The Witcher 3, for example, the player is acting as both themselves and the main character Geralt. The player will roleplay however they like, but Geralt needs to be an at least somewhat coherent character. It serves this constellation of agency well, to have Geralt be self-referential and even self-deprecating at times. This not only reminds the player of the distance between themselves and Geralt, 
but also makes any lack of coherence in his character more palatable because it's turned into a character trait. This character trait to boot resonates with the theme of Geralt simply being an extraordinary human without any overly serious hero man syndrome. Calling dips on that. Another example is how Undertale uses metalepsis in order to break itself. In fact, it does it so much that it's difficult to describe in short. But arguably the largest thematic thrust of the game is concerned with self-awareness, or a lack thereof. Whether it's Flowey discussing the repercussion for characters when the player restarts the game, or this little frog being aware that it's not in control of its own dialogue, or this literal wink at the player, it's all about bringing attention to the interplay between fiction and player. The player of Undertale is challenged to remember that what they're doing is playing a game, and in doing so become aware of what it means to enjoy a piece of media, and what it means to them specifically. Another favorite of mine that I'll let speak for itself is this scene from the introduction of Saints Row 4. Hold position. Let's take him out quietly. Stop sacrificing themselves to save us all. This is our final chance to say goodbye. So those are great examples of metalepsis, or general fourth wall breaking, used to interact with the distance between player and fiction. But what is a bad example of toying with the fourth wall? Ubisoft. Ubisoft games tend to be self-aware in a way that is anxious apologism rather than clever service of the fiction. You usually don't have to look very far to find them making fun of their own previous failures or shortcomings, such as the entire frame story in Black Flag. It's just one long running joke about how Ubisoft is a cynical, soul-destroying and monolithic factory for design by committee entertainment products. Um, their words, not mine. It's a thing they do throughout their communications with their audience, as seen in this marketing clip from 2017, where they make fun of their own inappropriate use of the word iconic. Or like in this clip from Watch Dogs 2, in which they complain about trailers being leaked. For Ubisoft, it's less about serving their fiction and the player's relationship to it, and more about invading their own work in order to justify their own practices. Compared to the other examples, it's in your face, it doesn't actually concern you or the game you're trying to enjoy, and only by virtue of their games having since become functioning products is it a passable apology. Okay, that turned out to be a bit of a tangent, but the point is that self-referentiality and toying around with the fourth wall can be a powerful tool in storytelling. And it goes beyond just the narrative, like Divinity Original Sin 2's comment on its own length as a formal aspect of its genre. If anything, I would like to see more creative and subtle uses of self-referentiality. One idea is to include a minigame, which is a copy of the game, in order to boil down the thematic and ludological elements to their essentials. That would be what is known as mise en abîme. Another would be to use flashbacks and flash-forwards, prolepsis and analepsis as they are known in narrative terms, but with mechanics as well as narrative. Sort of like a version of letting the player see all the powers of the main character before taking them away, but used at different points in the game for different results. Thanks so much for watching. If you know of any other examples of games using similar techniques, I would really like it if you put down a comment directing me in its way. What do you think about self-referentiality in games? Do you find it a captivating contrivance, or is it just a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing? Please remember to subscribe, but only if you pick the first option. Also remember to keep taking games way too seriously.